that we shall begin the second session of the program in a while. May I now have the privilege to invite on stage the chairperson of the second session, Gautam Mukhopadhyay. He is an Indian Foreign Service Officer who served, as, served in Mexico, Cuba, France, New York, and New York United Nations. Also an ambassador to Syria, Afghanistan, and Myanmar. And Sir Gordon Mukhopadhyay's wife is Nain Sal Hobum, who is also an ambassador to Indonesia, Serbia, and Lebanon. Gordon Mukhopadhyay is presently advising the Confederation of Indian Industry on Northeast and Southeast Asia, and also NITI Forum for the Northeast Policy Advisory for NITI Ayog and he is interested in the uses of bamboo and mud. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the chairperson for the second session, let us all put our hands together and welcome him. May I also have the privilege to invite on stage our resource person for the second session, Alison Franklin, who is basically from UK, but is currently working in Thailand. Alison Franklin, has been working in education for sustainable development for the past 12 years. She will now be talking about the impact hands-on experience which bamboo can have on children. Ladies and gentlemen, Alison Franklin on the stage. May I also invite on stage Tuan Nguyen. Tuan Nguyen is an architect and urban designer from Vietnam. He earned the Bachelor of Architect in Hanoi and degrees in Sustainable Design at the School of Architecture of Hanoi and Toulouse, France, as well as Master at Center for Architectural Sciences and Ecologies in New York, USA. He will be talking about the role of bamboo in Vietnamese culture in the past, its uses today, and ideas for the future of bamboo in Vietnam. Ladies and gentlemen, Tuan Nguyen on the stage. May I now uh, hand over the stage to the chairperson, Gautam Gopadhyay. We 
Good morning. We've had a few technical itches, so I'm just waiting to see if we'll get any of the videos today. So usually I'm used to speaking to uh, groups of seven-year-olds in small huddles in outdoor areas, so this is a, a bit of a different crowd with all these adults seated. I've travelled here today from Bangkok, Thailand. A city of 8 million people and 9 million cars. <clears throat> Ironically, the project I'm about to tell you about was temporarily shut down last week, along with every school in the city. Why? Because our air was too polluted to breathe. Too polluted solely by human activity that it was no longer safe to go outside. When, when children are no longer able to be educated because the air is too polluted to breathe, I think we can take that as a sign that environmental education should become somewhat a top priority. So that we don't end up living in a world where there's no choice but to stay inside. Air pollution being an issue most definitely not unique just to Bangkok. <laughs> My bamboo story starts back in 2015 when I was working as a grade one teacher in a small family-run international school on the outskirts of Bangkok. More specifically, with a group of energetic six-year-olds who had requested to learn the skills they would need to survive in the jungle. It being Bangkok, it was more of a concrete jungle and there weren't too many green spaces. So we settled for an abandoned football field in the centre of a car park. As the students began to learn to tie knots, build simple shelters and ignite fires, the irony wasn't lost on them. The juxtaposition of learning wilderness skills without a tree in sight got them thinking. The children suggested if there wasn't a jungle to play in, then maybe it was their job to plant one. And there began their love affair with bamboo. Little did we know then what a huge impact this little group of nature enthusiasts would make. With an enthusiastic nod of approval from our school principal, this abandoned patch of grass became ours to work with. So let's see what happens next. When the next generation, a group of city children with little or no experience with mud, are given a bunch of bamboo to plant and the opportunity to get mucky.
gemacht, sehr gerne. Danke. So, as you can see from the video, the patch of grass I spoke about quickly evolved. In fact, it is now known as the teepee farm, a hub for children to learn hands-on about sustainability. A farm built and designed entirely by children. So, how did it evolve? One afternoon, the original bamboo planting after-school club, club of six-year-olds emerged from a fire building session. Children's faces smothered in soot, reeking of campfire smoke, and the cheekiest smiles across their face. The school principal stopped them in their tracks and exclaimed, every child, everywhere, where are we? every child everywhere needs these experiences. And the whole school became involved. We devised a curriculum entitled Environmental Mindfulness, and our secret weapon, bamboo. When the next academic year began, science lessons from kindergarten to grade two were taught entirely through hands-on experience on a little patch of grass in the middle of the car park. The grade one students had played and planted on this land for a year already, and it was this cohort who suggested introducing our feathered friends, ducklings. They said that they would dig the pond themselves, and having gained a wealth of experience digging already, we knew this wouldn't be a problem. They campaigned that duck poop would inevitably help the bamboo to grow, and they weren't wrong. In little time, the next project was underway. The students spent weeks hammering in bamboo fences and digging out ducklings, a luxury lagoon. Every day in this space, you see that children truly are natural-born scientists. They are curious beings, eager to discover about the world. Give them unstructured time in nature, even a tiny space in the middle of a car park, and their innovation will astound you. But deprive them of building a relationship with the natural world and, the, and they won't even have seen all the beauty to know what there is to protect. I only, realized, I only realized how serious our bamboo journey had become the day that I received a very urgent email from the school council. The subject read, school council, top priority, have you got a tree house suitable, have you got a tree suitable for a tree house? Word of this exciting project spread, and the trees were studded like never before. Which trees were the oldest and sturdiest? Which had enough branches that could support a house? Where did we want our dream tree house to be positioned? The children were making all of the decisions. We found a sturdy looking mango tree, and the children began designing their dream house. They tested all of the different materials. This was still science class, after all. Metals, hardwoods, plastics, testing which would be strong enough to endure the weather, flexible enough to move in the wind with the trees, sturdy enough to hold children safely, a material that would ultimately decompose once redundant. And it will come as no surprise to you that it didn't take very long for children to choose bamboo as the material of their choice. The seven-year-olds recognize bamboo as being stronger than steel, only takes seven years to mature, very sustainable, would turn back, ultimately biodegrade, back into mud after use. These, youngs, these young minds, mostly aged five to eight, were motivated, keen to plan, learn and design, make mindful choices, always with their environmental footprint in mind. They began to understand just how much work goes into making things. A great lesson for young members of today's throwaway and fast fashion society. Here we have a whole school motivated and determined to build a structure with sustainability at the forefront of their minds. What would our world look like if future politicians, city planners, mainstream architects had at seven worked with bamboo and had naturally began to factor sustainability into their choices? So, with bamboo at the centre of our design, yet again, we set to work. So, how do a bunch of five to eight-year-olds build a treehouse? First, we did what we know best, and we dug. We got muddy again. We dug holes for some additional foundations, a simple task for the little ones. They were clear experts by now. Next, we soared. With clear boundaries, teamwork, and motivation, everybody soared. Teamwork and resilience were the only gateway to success. The students needed their friends to clamp down the wood and apply pressure, usually two students to a saw, and it being tough wood, you rotated often. Once the wood was cut to size, we sliced the bamboo to create flat panels using machetes, a favorite skill amongst the younger students. It was a truly beautiful sight to see students feeling heroic, admiring their pieces of, pieces of flat bamboo poles that they've produced. The child holding the machete is always the one in control. The one holding the hitter, the bamboo piece, asks three simple questions before anything happens. How many hits? How hard? Are you ready? 
The week after, children gained more confidence with bushcraft knives, taking the flat bamboo that they'd made, making them safe, carving the edges until they were smooth, an activity that children could do for hours, calmly and focused. That was a time lapse, but I don't think we're going to do that. <laughs> now, don't worry about it. Um, now, before I get accused of engaging in child labour, every child worked on the treehouse in an opt-in, opt-out basis. The students were taught the technical skills at the start of the session and had clear boundaries to ensure safety first. The students then had a choice whether to chip in and build to work on our community project, the treehouse, or to purposefully use their time elsewhere in nature. This can involve any, anything from rescuing freshly laid frog spawn from our pond, stopping our very hungry ducks from eating it all up, or reaching down to the rock layer of the mud pit and eagerly trying to identify which rock was which. Back to the treehouse. So, the construction. The students began putting their materials in place, and first came the floorboards. Using mostly hand drills and hammers, the students worked in pairs, placing floorboards in place that they'd previously cut, hand drilling holes, and hammering the nail through. The students knew their depth boundaries with tools. Their learning was purposeful and meaningful, constantly provoking questions surrounding um, sustainability and how long things took to make. Once the floor was in, we began working on the sides. Another time lapse that isn't working. Um, this is a job. A group came, they put them all in. I took them out. The next group came, they put them all in. A very satisfying piece of uh, completing the treehouse. Penultimately, the ladder. Now, this was the big talking point throughout the project. They were obsessed, so we made this part of the build into a competition. Each group made a bamboo ladder. They submitted rope ladders, tree ladders, detachable ladders, secret ladders into trap doors. Eventually, we settled for a rather elaborate design, which would also work as a climbing frame. Although much of the main construction was complete, students dipped back into their creative stage again and again, designing and attempted to build treehouse, every treehouse accessible, accessory imaginable. First, a slide, a must-have to every treehouse. A pulley system to get things in and out. Telescopes to keep watch. Uh, bamboo binoculars, bamboculars as they're known as. And the prize piece, oh... Where's it gone? Oh, they, they even went as far as creating their own tools from bamboo because it wasn't, <laughs> the tools they were using were metal and they, they'd begun to understand bamboo could do almost anything. But the prize piece, a zip line. As the students spent time working on the farm, their treehouse transformed from a castle to a pirate ship, a family home to a remote island. The students' imaginations were constantly at work, with nature as their only stimuli. So now we had a treehouse, a very group, a proud group of students, who, having now built a treehouse, had a unique set of skills. They had, after all, transformed a patch of grass into a farm. During this time, the older children had campaigned for piglets to eat our food waste. Our ducks had become broody and reproduced new ducklings, and our bamboo had, as promised, shot up at an alarming rate. So what did the farm, built and designed by children, represent? Teamwork and perseverance and innovation without which there would be no farm. A deep connection to nature, having spent the year planting the material they ultimately built their treehouse from. Safe and technical knowledge of how to use a range of hand tools with bamboo self-confidence and belief in themselves and their peers that they could build almost anything they wanted from the sustainable material, innovation and creativity, knowledge of sustainable materials, a good understanding of the life of bamboo from its cultivation, it, its use at maturity and the time it takes to turn back into mud. What would our world look like if all of the next generation gained these experiences and grew up reflecting constantly on their ecological footprint? Of course, the treehouse wasn't the end of the students' sustainable designs. The students continued spending time on the farm and learned through play and discovery. And without a major project in mind, they began to wonder what else they could build with their favourite wild grass. Free to put their ideas and skills into practice, they put bamboo to the test. Bamboo jewellery. Bamboolery. Piggy obstacle courses. Uh, toy boxes for their creations. A new, several new houses for their treasured ducks. Uh, bamboo doors, bamboo fences, and 
Then what I think was the ultimate, they started to ponder if there was anything bamboo couldn't do. They'd eaten sticky rice from it, eaten the shoots. They'd even tried to create a friction fire using only bamboo. And you can see our, our newest duck, Pippin, watching them there in the clip. <laughs> this was all the proof they needed that bamboo is so versatile and that with it they could build anything their little hearts desired. Even the parents got involved. A dad of a young boy in kindergarten came in with a model he'd built at home. Do you think you can build this on the farm, he asked. And off we went again. The younger students splitting, cleaving and carving with the older ones lashing the dome together. The bamboo revolution is still in full swing today. Well, apart from the days when we're stuck inside due to high levels of pollution. Bamboo is our superhero of the building world. A wonderful wild grass that oxygenates our planet and is helping to build almost anything these little hearts desire. This is the material that the students watch decompose and turn into the mud they need to plant more bamboo. The beautiful cycle is endless. We have a lot to thank bamboo for. This renewable resource has taught our students so much about sustainability. It's provided them with the knowledge of what our plants need to survive and how to manage this. Our students now give more thought to what their belongings are made from and have an appreciation for how long things take to decompose. They want to reduce their consumption, reuse items and recycle goods. Bamboo has inspired these young minds, the next generation, to take action, be more responsible. They are proud to be global citizens and to encourage those around them to do the same, encouraging their families and friends to be more envir environmentally mindful. A growing generation of envir environmentally mindful citizens. So, could bamboo be the tool to help the next generation grow up to live in a world where once again our air is finally safe to breathe? Thanks for listening. Here's our Instagram at the TP Farm if you'd like to follow our journey. Hello. Um, my name is Thuan Nguyen, an architect and urban designer from Vietnam. Uh, I would like to thank you first for this opportunity to present to you Bamboo in Vietnam, especially um, to the World Mammal Organization Board and uh, Dr. Nimala Chongtham for this op opportunity. So, uh, this is a few 
um, glimpse into my talk. I would talk about how to make it as a full screen. I'll talk about the. Um, this is forward. Yes. Yeah. The bamboo in the past, how is, how it was integral in the Vietnamese culture, and then uh, what is the use of bamboo in the modern time, and also some of the idea for the future. A little bit of overview in Vietnam. We have a small country, long and narrow, but uh, we have a high density from the old time. We rank number 14 um, populated country in the world with 94 million people, occupying a land of 330 to 600 kilometer square. And uh, we have 1.5 million hectares of bamboo which um, only after India, China, and Myanmar. Ecologically, we have different regions like this in Vietnam. We have tropical and we have subtropical regions, but mainly we have the two deltas, one in the north uh, region and one in the south, and some highland and along coastal region. Along those um, ecological areas we are occupied by 54 different ethnics uh, and they can be grouped in eight main groups depending on their uh, dialect uh, language and culture so there's there would be a lot to cover all of them because almost every culture have a very strong bamboo um, culture so my focus today most will be mostly from the, the, main, the main ethnic, which is the first one you see here, the Viet Tích, um, from the northern, northern Delta of Vietnam. And from there, they go to other regions to occupy and populate it in other regions. These are the two deltas, one in the north named Red River Delta, and one from the south, um, Mekong Delta, which is the last the last uh, gateway of the Mekong River that originated from, from the Himalaya to the sea. And in Vietnam, we often say uh, there's a symbol of um, this woman, Vietnamese, that carry a shoulder pole with two baskets. And we often say that that's a symbol of Vietnam with uh, that link the two delta. So you can see here that two main rice production uh, area of Vietnam. Since I'm talking about the past, then I, I try to get some data from the past. This is the, uh, this is the density map of the Red River Delta from the French uh, geographer Pierre Guru. And it was in 1930, and it's already very high populated, um, mainly at least uh, the, the moderate uh, population density would be around 500 people per square kilometer, whereas in France maybe 160 people or something like that at the time. So the point being here is that uh, how do people occupy that land, how do they make the most out of it? Uh, with that density, because it's a constant problem until from that time until now. Um, bamboo in the material civilization. Um, I would like to talk about how, of course, in Asian country, every con um, every regions we are involved with bamboo products and tools. Um, but I try to make the point of how bamboo is become so integral in the culture, and we can call it the material civilization. Um, I, have a, I heard a saying from a scientist is that technology um, 
civilization doesn't necessarily based just on how advanced the technology is, but more about how humane your technology is used in the everyday life. So for such a poor country like Vietnam, um, you will see how bamboo is so involved in their life and become a culture. So everyday item is this um, object in the house. Uh, I cannot find every word in English, so I put that in Vietnamese. So you could uh, just look at that, look at the picture and can tell what it is. So mostly of the two, is, these two is in the kitchen and it's to, um, for the rice making, rice producing, preserving. Um, you have chopstick, you have the hammock, and own kind of furniture, and um, building component like this to avoid glare and providing shading. In terms of uh, everyday life architecture, uh, a house in the northern delta is look like this. You only have a pond, a garden, a kitchen separated from the main house, um, and Bamboo is everywhere in this setting. The, this the um, roof type. Mainly bamboo is in the, the roof of rafter uh, purling, but uh, bamboo and wood is interchangeable in Vietnamese architecture. So if people cannot afford wood, they would use bamboo. There are different kind of uh, trusses and name for it. Uh, not only in the household items, in the agriculture tools, bamboo is also um, is everywhere, uh, mostly in the handle of the tool. So this is the tillage and sowing uh, tools for agriculture production. Uh, for transportation as well, they use that bamboo stick, uh, shoulder pole, that you can transport things and you can also um, use that for harvesting. Or you can do irrigation system like this. So you can transfer water from one rice field to another. For harvesting, for unhusking the rice and even for measuring. So bamboo is not just the tools, but it's become a kind of a measuring system. Um, people don't use like kilogram or pounds, but they would use the unit of bamboo tool to, uh, to measure um, the unit. So this particular object is about nine kilogram of uh, bamboo rice, uh, uh, sorry, of rice and it's made of bamboo, and for food preservation as well. A day of a farmer, I, since I cannot gather on the picture of the modern day, I kind of look back in the book and see how bamboo is involved in, in a farmer. Uh, a farmer's, farmer population took about like 90% of Vietnam in pre-industrial area. area. So here's the protagonist. He's a farmer. He would wake up like 5 a.m. every day, sweep the yard with a bamboo broom. He would eat breakfast, very simple, on that bamboo, uh, bamboo bed. But this bed is situated itself between the inside and outside the house, and it's multifunctional. He would go to the field with his buffalo. On the words here in red is the tool that um, made our bamboo. And you can see a little bit of the poem I put up there just to show that how bamboo had just escaped the material life of it. It's become really a cultural um, element of Vietnamese identity. And then he's going to work in the field, of course. He's going to take a break around lunchtime, smoke that bamboo bong, 
I don't encourage you to smoke, but that's how it works. Uh, he would go back with that uh, basket in hand, and um, do you know what is inside there? So in Vietnamese culture, we, it's in such a poor country, we cannot waste everything. So on the way back, he would carry that um, buffalo, his own buffalo dung to come back home to use this for, for fire, to cooking. And if he's lucky, he could find a, uh, a frog or, or something and uh, could have a frog and bamboo shoot which is an amazing dish. Take a nap on the same bamboo bed. Uh, going to work now on the, crop, on the crop field with his wife uh, with this bamboo handle. And go fishing with a bamboo stick, swimming, and then do some fencing before it's getting dark and then again with his wife to have some dinner. That's how a day work in, in a farmer's life in Vietnam in, uh, in the old day. So bamboo is everywhere in every, in every um, activities, daily activities of a farmer. And not only in the life of a family, uh, bamboo take a very important role in protecting community space like this. So you could see almost in every village we would have a bamboo uh, hedge that go around them. It provides shade, provides shelter for people, and it's the physical boundary and also mental boundary for the village. That's uh, a typical plan of the village where you can see the bamboo is all around. Um, in, case of, in case of the war also, bamboo hedges were used to protect the, the people. For example, here, um, that's in the world against the French before, um, bamboo was used to interconnect different villages and make a bamboo hedges on the route to protect the people. And in fact, is it acknowledged by President Obama in 2016 when he came to Vietnam and he acknowledged uh, how bamboo is integral in the culture. And he say, um, your beloved land was not always your own, but like bamboo, the unbroken spirit of Vietnamese people is there uh, always. So that's the village. And how about the city? Uh, the, the green circles here is represent the, the villages. And in the center, you have a city. So bamboo is the protection element of every village, as we know. And um, a very interesting idea about Vietnamese city is that the worst city, the worst city itself is the citadel and the marketplace. Uh, that's why I bring up uh, the idea of the marketplace here. The city in the old time, they are just administrative. It's not, there's no really what we have like in the city life nowadays. It's just for the king and the second layer is for the officials and the third layer is the house, housing for inhabitants. And there's something interesting happening in between that inhabitant layers and the villages around the city, which is the marketplace. And the marketplace here is, since it's temporary, it's make up bamboo. So we can see how bamboo is protecting the village, but also it's become a protective element and make this urban life happen. That's, uh, these are the few photos of um, Vietnamese market, marketplace. You see everywhere uh, people with bamboo hat, you know, uh, baskets, and all kind of uh, shoulder poles, uh, all kind of uh, products involving bamboo. 
And uh, Edith Shulu, an uh, American writer, when she came to Vietnam in 1993, she, she was immediately fall in love with that shoulder pole, which is another symbol of Vietnamese, uh, of Vietnamese people, especially the woman. That simple shoulder pole is going every day with a woman on her shoulder, you know, like 12, 10 kilometers a day to transport products. It's used to carry water, carry um, breakfast uh, items, and all kind of other things in the market. So it was an amazing, um, simple piece of bamboo, and it's so useful in the Vietnamese culture. And even this woman here, she have his own, her own household moving with bamboo pole uh, with her own two children. That's how is it made. Uh, you cut it and you choose the um, very kind of old, maybe six, seven years old uh, bamboo pole, um, cut in half, you smoke it and you know, it looks simple, but it really requires some very skill to produce it. Talking about bamboo pole, people not only use, produce bamboo pole, but do all kind of other crafts. So um, most of the bamboo products is produced by the farmer itself, but it does, it did come to the point that we need uh, more tools that we need to trade, and that's how the craft villages happen. So around Hanoi alone, there's a lot of craft villages making basket or bamboo hat, etc. Like this one. Um, so I've been talking about the domestic life, the community life, the marketplace in the city. Um, bamboo also appear on the festival itself. Um, as here in Manipur, I can see the relevance. The festival is so important for agriculture life because without festivals, nothing happen. Agriculture cannot take place or begin without festival. A festival would be the mark the beginning and the end of the season. So you know, bamboo here in the, the two bamboo two with the buffalo to inaugurate uh, a season of cultivation. Or uh, on the still, or uh, here you see the swing. And also a lot of music musical instrument is used uh, bam using bamboo. So to close that um, part of Vietnamese culture, I, I'm trying to make the point here that uh, bamboo is for the poor and it's no misconception in the past. It's for the poor. And I think the lesson is learned here is not, uh, it's about how we use bamboo to overcome that and how do a close self-sustained economy is important and how resourcefulness the, the farmer of Vietnam have come up with to deal with scarcity of resources. Um, so for me, bamboo is not just the product itself or it's not just the material element, but it's the immaterial element as well. And I like to call it the scaffold of the farmer civilization. How about bamboo is used in modern uses, in modern day? Uh, we have craft, um, more and more artisans, they do, uh, they, they come up with pieces using bamboo and conducting a workshop like uh, Tan Bo from Tabu Workshop in Da Nang. So if you guys have a chance to visit Da Nang, go to the Tabu Workshop. It's an amazing artisan and he provides tools and three hours of education and you would spend three hours and you come home with your own piece. Like that. Um, bamboo is also used for, bam for building materials, uh, bamboo decking, bamboo block, panels, veneer, for furniture, and architecture. Like these uh, prefab houses, 
uh, this office and studio by Le Lung Ngoc Architect, and of course by Võ Trọng Nghĩa, as you just mentioned earlier, the, the famous architect of Vietnam. He used uh, a specific bamboo piece in the south named Tong Bong. Uh, it's about four centimeter in diameter, and the way it works is to work in a bundle to creating trusses and beam systems. Uh, my last part is bamboo in the future. So for me, I, I think um, there's a lot of exciting things going on around the world, and in particular in Vietnam as well, for bamboo furniture, architecture, and products. But um, a, a lot of time I'm, I'm perplexed about, especially for architecture, like even this building. It looks beautiful, but usually in a resort like that, the first thing we need to, they need to do is to clear the land. And a lot of time, it's, you need to get people out of the way first to come up with a you know, so-called sustainable design solution. Uh, for me, I feel more drawn into the idea of bamboo as a civil, civilized uh, materials like in the past. So what is the future of bamboo? Should we continue doing that? Of course, we cannot stop it, and we, it's nice. But uh, what is the alternative? Uh, one of them, I think, is collaboration like this, the bamboo workshops. So I've been privileged to participate in the bamboo workshop with uh, Dr. Helen Nori. So some of you might know her from the University of Tasmania, Australia. They have a four years program in Vietnam. Uh, they would, the student would come to Vietnam twice a year to conduct workshop in different provinces. Um, this workshop we do in Hanoi, Saigon, and Dien Bien in the northern region of Vietnam. So this workshop is very important in terms of introducing new technologies, of using bamboo for the students and for the farmer. This is the structure we raised uh, at my old school in Hanoi. It's going to last for uh, one year, um, and it's integrated for the celebration of Teachers' Day in Vietnam. Agriculture is another workshop of UTAS, um, University of Tasmania. They go into the mountain uh, and doing cow shed for people like that. So, help them identify bamboo species, but also raising structure for, um, for animals. So they came last July to do this, and in November they come back to check how it works and fix it. These are a few images of the, of the workshop. Uh, we go around different area and identify bamboo species. Uh, Another, another um, venue for the future. This is the future, it's already happened, but it's continue happening, so that's why I categorize them as a future. Uh, Fuan Bamboo Village is another place to cultivate bamboo, um, preserve bamboo. Uh, it's organized by Dr. Mi Hạnh, a, a biologist in the south of Vietnam, and that village is uh, reforestation uh, learning place, a uh, place for bamboo conservation uh, to improve agriculture productivity and to transfer knowledge, uh, exchanging traditional knowledge and modern technologies. This is her on the right, third one from the right, uh, Mi Hai. Uh, this another Another project um, named Thanh Tam Bamboo Eco Park in Thanh Hoa. This is the most large, the largest area of bamboo in Vietnam with the best quality. And I happened to work with them on this project particularly. It's 160 uh, hectare of, of bamboo land. Uh, as you can see here, it's four hours south of Hanoi. 
uh, and if you fly from Saigon, it's only two hours. So the location is, is um, quite well connected. Uh, in, and in 2021, they're going to make the airport uh, international airport. So the connection is good for the, for the project. And it's 60 kilometers from that area to the um, deep water seaport. So it's, that means it also have a potential to export bamboo product. That's a project. You can see there's one island there and one inland. Up, uh, in total, it's 160 hectare. And have different... So the idea is that the chairman of the project, he wanted to invite a lot of different bamboo architects to do different buildings and uh, promote ecotourism in the area with bamboo buildings. Um, so I was invited to come in, and what I propose is that um, I think that a cluster of bamboo buildings for people to come in is, is um, it's not a bad idea, but, but people would come and go. So what, we, what, what else we can do? I put, um, oh, in, in the area, there's only one or two buildings of Bo Chong Yi architect already. But what I propose is to, to have a bamboo center, because here, uh, with the bamboo center, you can do more with your land, because the, the land is, is large and with good quality of bamboo. So if we can have a bamboo center, then you can train artisans, you can transfer knowledge, you can invite people to come to do workshops. So what is that I propose, and recently he ap approved it, the idea, and hopefully it's going to be constructed this year sometimes. So the center is going to have these elements, uh, uh, nine elements. The building is organized around a central courtyard, and you have the main number one here, the main studio and gallery at Bamboo, with two wings building um, where you can do conduct it. You can conduct a craft workshop. Uh, there's a building workshop, which is number three. And number five, six, seven is a loading area and bamboo treatment facilities. Um, when you come in, you would come in a row uh, with bamboo around and go pass by a cafeteria on the pond. And lastly, on the mountain opposite of it, you would find area for artist residences where artists are going to be invited, and each one would have a bungalow and garden to produce their artwork. That's the perspective. So yeah, that's the idea of the center. I think the future needs to be a, a collaborative um, project so that the local people um, can learn from the artisans and, um, and the academic, the workers, so we can have more people can have, more people have skill to do with bamboo craft and building. Just like in the old time, the farmer made the tool for themselves. And that's how they can dignify their identity by doing work with bamboo. Um, last, last project here I just want to show just because before I came back to Vietnam, I happened to work with a, a clinic in Haiti. It's a non-profit organization who committed to, to helping pregnant women in Haiti uh, to reduce their maternal mortality. So what it can be do with the Bamboo Center here is the idea is to I think that we can transfer the knowledge from one part of the world to the other to, to, through bamboo. And the idea is for Haitian people can later learn on that and do the, the clinic themselves. This Freddy, uh, the doctor, a Haitian doctor who come up with the idea of the nonprofit, I've been working with him for a year. Um, this is the center you can have. You see the guest house on the up, upper right and the rest of it is the clinic. And hopefully it's going to own be with bamboo. This is a 3D printing model of the buildings. 
you have library, you have guest houses, you have clinic, you have training center, you have vehicle um, fishing center. So every day the clinic they go, they, like 20 of them would go on one vehicle and go to different areas uh, and set up their own clinic to treat women. So that become more and more demand so that they need to have a training center to have more mobile clinic and eventually would have their own clinic. And this is something, uh, this is the trusses that we're gonna hope to build with my coworker uh, in New York for this project to work in the bamboo center to do bamboo trusses and then shift to Haiti. Um, and hopefully from that point on, they can cultivate bamboo and do that themselves. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. 
I'm extremely sorry. Um, uh, may I take this moment to felicitate our speaker and the chairperson for the session now? Um, I would like to request uh, Sri B. Vaipe, IES Principal Secretary, Textiles, Commerce and Industry, to honor our resource person today. Chairperson, Gautam Mukhopadhyay. Alison Franklin. And Tuan Nguyen. So before we begin a discussion hour, I would like to call the speakers of the first session, Hemant Bedekar, who had spoken on Bamboo Society of India, Himena Londono, uh, who spoke on ecotourism with bamboo in Colombia, and Kavita Chaudhuri, who had spoken on exploration of bamboo fabric with national dye, natural dyes for sustainability. Let's all welcome them back on the stage for the discussion hour.
question, I think, gentlemen there. Uh, Uh, let me say that I think this has been pretty much the dream of policymakers uh, to 
central government as well as the northeast for quite some time. And while an immediate solution is not available, there have been a number of steps that have been taken in place to, uh, to reopen the access of the northeast towards the Bay of Bengal and towards the sea. Uh, please don't forget that bef before partition, the northeast did have access to the sea through Chittagong port. Now there are two major initiatives underway right now, in fact more than two, uh, but let me just mention uh, two key ones. One is the Karadan uh, uh, multimodal transport transit uh, project, which is a project that opens up from the northeast through Mizoram and ultimately has a multimodal, that means a river as well as a uh, road uh, connectivity to a port called Sitwe, the old Akya port in Myanmar. Uh, that is likely to take another at least three years before it comes to fruition. But in the meantime, the government of India has been working very hard with Bangladesh to be able to open Bangladesh to transit trade. And both land, river, as well as port trade. And, very, and steps have been taken to connect uh, Agartala, for example, towards uh, uh, Chilagong and Boxes Bazaar. Uh, and an MOU has also recently been signed about the use of a couple of ports, I think Mangla port and Chittagong port for, uh, for, tra for transport and connectivity. So I think there have been very positive developments uh, in, uh, in, in connectivity uh, for the Northeast, both towards the East and towards the Bay of Bengal. And a very important point that you made is that in a way the big market for those products lies in the rest of India. Uh, it is not necessarily, I mean, the international market is also there. But this is a market for this missile. I'm addition for the, on behalf of the Tripura. There's, hello. Sorry. Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I'm on behalf of the Tripura government. Sorry, on behalf of the Tripura government. Right. But please, let's follow some order. Uh, you have something specific to say on this? Yeah. 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 Uh, Actually, now the Tripura government, uh, the uh, bamboo extract at the uh, Chittagong, uh, Akhora. Akhora. Akhora okay. is another. Yeah, this is not Akhora, this is uh, only Agartala to the Akhora, it is uh, 5 km. So, even the uh, uh, provincial government uh, restricted the bamboo the export like there. Yeah. So, now the we don't. We are not exporting, we are from South India. Right? But I know I that you are discussed that uh, in Sanskrit also they are, uh, you are truly of now the of free, truly of free. And uh, Chittagong and uh, they are through the Manu, only for 75 km, the open, all of that open. No sir, what? for South India people, if they want to make as a protection in your Tripura yeah. or, or in other knowledge say in the future our uh, yeah. all of the entire the your Bangalore anywhere that's we are the problem provide the sixty percent incentive from the Tripura. Yeah. So now the actual the uh, government people's government is the nothing the initiative so you are the industrial base policy. So now in new government is the something the uh, is the taking the so uh, policy taken. So you letter be the letter, but you are now is the process for you. Yeah, just here. Yeah. Let him come and meet the office. We will discuss later. No, according to government or new policy is yeah. anyhow the transportations by road it may not cost that so easily. I, yeah, yeah. In future, my my question is that in future, if you take any transportation by I sea or by okay. own water, no, no, this is a, it's a, 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 a I think let's not make this a completely bilateral discussion. Yeah. If your point is very well taken, you made a very good point. Uh, we had a request from I think the lady there, please. Uh, hi, I'm Kathy Patel, and uh, I'm working in a new mass landscape firm in Mumbai. So I'm an architect. So uh, I have one comment for Alison and the question for Hema Shrinivasan, sir. sir. Uh, Alison, I, you, your work is really inspirational, and I really love the entire presentation. And uh, it is something uh, very important. What the entire architectural education is failing over here. Because um, we are, uh, that was on the junior level, but even at the graduation level, the basics hand-on experience is not that much exposed. So it's really great that you are, you have taken an initiative for students at such a lower level to incorporate them in a, you know, at the basic stage of their life. And one of my questions for the Hemant Bhelika sir is, 
it's um, is there a possibility for uh, um, SB, um, BSI, Bamboo, uh, Bamboo Society of India to collaborate with uh, Maharashtra Ecotourism Board? Because uh, if you visit the Maharashtra Ecotourism Board website, all of the accommodations which are suggested or promoted by this uh, platform are concrete based accommodations and which would promote basically uh, bamboo blinders or wooden windows or something like that. So it's, um, it's a platform which should promote uh, materials like bamboo, right, definitely, or vernacular or local materials. But at this stage, the ecotourism itself, or the government board, ecotourism itself is promoting material which is not native and which is destructing the environment itself. So you have a wildlife sanctuary and then you have a small 3 by 3 concrete structure wherein you explore the entire nature around and at the end you sleep in a concrete box. So then you are not promoting ecotourism, then that's just, uh, you know, I don't know what to call that thing. So is there a possibility of collaboration or we could think in some lines to that? Actually, very, very good point. We, Babu Society of India, tried for several years that there should be the accommodation of the Babu furniture in this purchasing process of the government. We are trying our hard. Sometimes we get success, sometimes we are not getting any success. Unfortunately, yet the bureaucrats were not able to understand what is the importance of power. Because uh, there are several uh, answers or several problems were there according to them. I am not going in detail for that. But nowadays the situation is changing very slowly but it is changing. They definitely the government is now planning to purchase some furnitures at several levels in the government departments. And when the government department purchases the furniture naturally, even though it is hardly 10%, it is a huge quantity. So, if it will be done, then naturally the, uh, the furniture makers as well as the architects who are designers also, they will also get the chance to put the, their ideas before the people. We are trying our hard. Only thing is that it takes time, that is true. But it will happen. And in case of any other institutions, it may be government or it is non-government, we are totally open to collaborate with anybody. Because we are not any profit makers, we are the gathering of all sorts of the people in the society who are the Babu lovers. So naturally anybody who is coming over there, we are ready to welcome and we are ready to uh, extend our hands to collaborate with them. I think I have... Yes, thank you so much, sir. Okay. Um, you know, before we sort of close this session, uh, I wonder if there's any question from anyone in Manipur yeah, yeah. for Vietnam. Yeah. In particular, because of the great sort of similarity and the possibilities that I see for cooperation between Manipur and the Northeast Indian Thank you. My friend Atuan, I just want to inquire about the handicraft sector from Vietnam. I haven't seen lots of coil, uh, uh, bamboo coil product in the international market. How are they made? They are made in the cottage level or village level or in the big uh, industry level. Yeah, bamboo coiling. Uh, mostly the bamboo products is produced in the crop villages. Uh, recently, there are uh, company producing um, different handicraft products and there's an ongoing trend of the company becoming a social entrepreneur that they would be based in, in the middle of uh, the, near the village. And they would employ the villagers who already have the skills uh, and train them to do new products. I'm overwhelmed by the mainly villages, uh, uh, crop villages. Because of the standardization, the same ball looks the same thing. Because in the handicap sector, it's different. One size with a size difference will be there. But in your Vietnam, the Canada is so high. Very high quality. So, uh, let me just add to that. I think one of the 
innovations that Vietnam has done to the extent that I know at least that I've seen is they have developed this idea of crafts villages. So uh, a village has specialized in, a, let's say, a certain craft, paper toys or uh, wooden toys or bamboo products. So the village itself becomes a tourist destination because it has developed a reputation for a particular product. And in many ways, I think there are also issues of work ethic and so on. Vietnamese are very hardworking, very disciplined, and I think if we could also adopt that kind of hard work and discipline, I'm sure we would create the standardized products that Vietnam has. But at the same time, the club villages is disappearing because it uh, belongs to the small close economy. So maybe it's for their, their own villages or their neighbor villages. So we are not so good with large scale production, you know, exporting. That's the idea that I think the future should we should revitalize those villages and work with them. But otherwise they're gonna be disappeared actually. So uh, I think the gentleman from Kerala has been very keen to uh, ask a second question. Uh, absolutely, please be quick. Uh, uh, it is somewhat a question as well as a concern. So when you work, especially for bamboo, like if government gets involved, especially apart from private stakeholders, whenever we work on a project of bamboo, the technicalities are quite very much different as compared to the conventional building sector. But mostly, what happens when you work on a government project is the people who handle this. I don't have no offense to any governmental authorities, but this is what we face. Like when we start handling those projects, the projects have been considered very much in private forms like what happens in the concrete buildings, right from the design schedules to the payments. This is the grassroots realities actually. But whereas the entire technicality of working on a bamboo structure is very, very different as compared to that of a concrete building. So it's very difficult for us to you know, educate a government department and get it done like, okay, this, this is what is the difference because educating the department is more expensive than actually designing it. So, and uh, this is actually a fact. I don't know whether I should say it here or not, but this is actually a fact. And if at all the awareness has to come, uh, if it takes too long, maybe, I don't know. Uh, Please, quick. I think you've made your point. Any other point? So, how can we actually mitigate this issue? <laughs> Look, what you say is very valid. But I think first, work within your architect's community. What is the acceptability of bamboo within the architect community itself? How can architects take up the issue of building codes so that the government is sensitized to the possibility of architecture, not only in bamboo but also in art, like in ways that you know they are adapted, adopted codes? Now, I think you know in all these endeavors, the professional group has to take the lead, and in this case, I would say the architects associations of India should take the lead in being able to kind of provide the advisory uh, sort of counseling to the government that, you know, just as you have building codes with concrete and steel and masonry and so on, you can also have building codes for mud and bamboo and other reconstruction materials. And I think the point was made somewhere else that, you know, a, a lot of this alternative architecture hardly has acceptability within the professional communities itself. So let's start first working within the professional professional community and side by side. Please do work with the government, please do work with the Bamboo Society. I think these are all advocacy groups that we can utilize to be able to advance this work. Look, this is a this is a community of the converted. We need to convert people to these ideas outside this community. And I think we need to take this message across very strongly. I take your point, but let's start with our second. Hi. Hello. Yes. 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 Uh, uh, I appreciate the way they have done it in Vietnam. Uh, it has been a self-sufficient uh, system. Do we really need to uh, kind of uh, push towards the, or even for that example, Manipur, towards the growth which is fast growing and kind of, uh, should the export be the way? Uh, that is my general question. Anybody can answer. 
Uh, let me take that question because actually it was one of the points that I wanted to make. Uh, you know, a very interesting point was made to me on the side of this conference by Dr. Krish. Uh, it's very tempting, and this is not a criticism of those who want, so to say, commercial and industrial applications of bamboo, but it's very tempting to jump to commercial and industrial applications of bamboo and other products because it's offers scale and makes a lot of money. Uh, but the point that Dr. Bish made was actually we need to start beginning with ourselves. How we can reintroduce and integrate bamboo in our daily life in many of the ways that Mr. Tuan said. And this is not just out of a question of selfishness. Yeah. Because actually it's also a question of a kind of grassroots development uh, for which I think uh, uh, Alison Frank gave another approach yeah. Which is so that these things become our habits, and because they have become our habits, then they get disseminated and spread uh, that way. In a way, a practice is the best habit. Uh, so it's not necessarily the competition, and it's not necessarily the commercial application that necessarily bad. Mr. Bharati, in his first presentation on bamboo as a biofuel, gave the example of scalable cultivation of bamboo. Not for necessarily for profit, but for as a replacement for uh, uh, you know fossil fuels. So uh, there can be uh, large scale cultivations that can also be uh, contributing to uh, the environment. But I think it's a very good point that you made the tension between uh, a kind of non-commercial self-sustaining use as well as a commercial use which has some some implications for sustainability. And obviously, I think. <coughs> Uh, one way uh, that uh, has been suggested, and I think uh, Susan Lucas also made this point that you know let's begin with local species, yeah. let's begin and because they belong to part of an ecosystem. How can we make the maximum use of the species that we have? How can we use those species for uses that we are not actually making? Yeah. This doesn't exclude the role for exotic species as Chimena uh, Londonio showed in uh, in Colombia, uh, but. Uh, uh, the use for exotic species will be specific to a particular purpose uh, and should always weigh the, the risks of uh, you know, the kind of impact of exotic species on the local ecology and, and environment. Uh, but I think it's a very good point and I'm glad to you. Please.
Uh, I think we have to call this. Uh, Excuse me. We one still have one question. One, 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 one word I have to take from all of us. Uh, MNG, Romandito, Antino, and Mr. Tuan from Vietnam. Bamboo is Can you called. Raise your hand. Where? It's me. It's me. It's me from Bangalore, Ravi Sharma. Please be quick. Only one question. Answer. Bamboo is called wood or grass. From Vietnam, from Antonio, Colombia, and uh, MNG from India. Please tell me, sir. Bamboo is called wood or grass. It's a grassy wood. It's a grassy wood. <laughs> Botanically, it is only grass, but its growth pattern is not like grass, it is like wood. similar to wood, but not exactly again the wood. No, sir, tell me one word wood or grass. It is a grass. Hey, one second. It is a grass, yes, but it can be used for substitute of wood. No, sir, I want grass or wood. No, no. <laughs> I hope this is not an inquisition. Uh, Antonio, sir. Antonio. Evolutionary bamboo is a poasia. It's a grass. grass. So we have to think bamboo as a crop. But the sugar cane is a cousin of bamboo. Rice is a cousin of bamboo. Corn is a cousin of bamboo. We, we have to see bamboo like a, a grass, and like a crop. So final we, eat, we eat bamboo. We yes. don't eat tree. Yes, it's called grass then. <laughs> if you want to satisfy what, what yourself. What do you want to say? Sir, in, in case we are done some business in this, no? Many people used to take the forest permit and all, no? Then it is called, in India it is called wood. So no. in other space... No, no, I'm sorry. That I'm sorry. Is now we have declared on the platforms of Lok Sabha that it is a grass and it took 70 years for us. Yes. It is very unfortunate part of it. Yes. Each and every bamboo book or each and every botanical book takes it as a grass right from the beginning. Okay. But only some people with their vested interest put it in the wood. But now it has been clear. There is no controversy now. It is a grass. I think Thank this is the last word on that. No more on this. Uh, one last question from the front. In India, lakhs of houses are being... Microphone, microphone. Yes. In India, lakhs of houses are being constructed every year for BPM people, below poverty level people. And uh, no state government is willing to come forward to take up bamboo housing. Why it is so? And how best to sensitize the state governments to go for bamboo housing? I don't think our battle is quite qualified to answer that, maybe Mr. Can I answer this later? Okay. Just I will have a comment, not an actual answer because I am also not a competent enough to answer your question. But it is the mentality that the villagers always want the construct, house constructed with cement and steel. Unless and until that is not removed from their mindset till it will be demanded by the people and whatever is demand, government will provide. Can I just, uh, can I just reply to this word if possible? Uh, see, the moment we talk about an EWS housing scheme that is economically weaker scheme on the housing for the poor, basically what we are trying to deliver is a good uh, housing condition in which, uh, which is like private like which tries for but a big span of time and nothing like which is temporary. Now once we talk about bamboo, bamboo can be taken two ways. Like we can make a temporary shelter out of that as well as a very professional and a very long lasting structure. Moment we talk about a very professionally properly designed structure which can last for long, it is no more very cheap as compared to concrete or a conventional building. So what we can say is like we have a wrong notion in our mind that a bamboo building is always cheap. It is not so. Bamboo buildings are not extremely cheap as compared to a concrete and conventional building. What it is, it is a much more cleaner structure, it is a much more sustainable structure. Obviously there are a lot of avenues in which we can cut down the cost, but it is not, never it is too cheap as compared to that, so that we can actually bring it down to an EWS level without considering the additional parameters into the picture. I, I think well, I would like to make a comment about uh, 
houses are not normal for Colombian government. Uh, we used to have a lot of earthquakes in Colombia, and uh, we uh, are, are a good architect designed very nice house solution for the people affected by the earthquake. But the government didn't take care about bamboo, and they invest in 10,000, 100, or 100,000 houses. Why? Because there are strong economic interests for other companies. So it's mainly for that. It's not because we, have, we are not demonstrating that to have a bamboo house is safer, is nicer, is what is a bigger house site. For the same price, we can bring a, um, more area. We can bring 52 uh, square meters when the concrete house, they keep only 36 square meters. But there are a strong economic interest behind these systems. Yes, just a minute, sir. There is another thing that, as uh, Mr. Mukhopadhyay has pointed out, that yet, in the defined, uh, definition also, bamboo structure is always called as a temporary structure. Unless and until we will not make the code and contract, either the, the number of the coding and it, it should be proven in the law or in the technical terms that it is a permanent structure, then maybe people will accept it. Can also please short and quick question. Sorry, please. I think this can go on and on. Uh, I would strongly suggest that now we conduct the rest of the discussion outside the auditorium. Uh, I'm sure your lunch is also waiting for you. I'd like to take this opportunity first of all to thank all the participants this morning who are present with us, as well as uh, the last panel that I have chaired, Alison Frank and Mr. Panguyen, uh, for their excellent and enlightening uh, presentation. Thank you very much to all our resource person and speaker today. With that, we've come to the end of day three session. I would like to thank each and every one of you who participated today for your participation. We truly appreciate it. I have a small announcement. Uh, for those of you participating in the poster making session, uh, it is informed that uh, all of you have to be present at your respective, near your respective poster by 2.30 because the judges will have to come and interact with uh, all the participants. So I would like to request the participants to the poster maker to please kindly be present near your respective poster by 2.30. Uh, post lunch, we have a technical training program which will be conducted in the painting hall. Uh, first, we will have hands-on training on the creative skill workshop in Bamboo by Subham Dambi and handicraft by Den Subham Kandi, a bamboo artisan from Manipur. Uh, yes, it will be at the painting hall. I'm sorry? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, and, and we shall now take a lunch break for an hour. I would like to request the partisan delegates to please uh, proceed towards your left, somewhere on my right, for lunch and the speakers and the other uh, distinguished guests. I would like to request you to proceed towards my left on the dining hall. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay. 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 Okay.
Then I don't know. Put in my seat.